So in present times, we see that the mortality has gone down. So in the 1970s, there was about a 50% severe mortality rate. And in the 2000s, now it's about 25%. It's much less in children. And the reason why there's been such a change in the last 40 to 50 years is that uh, there's been changes in ICU management. You've got CAT scans had been now introduced in that period of time, ICP and CPP measurements, and maintaining physiological parameters. I know last week we talked about um, measuring ICPs, and honestly, I'm a huge advocate for measuring ICPs. There's no, no substitute for having an actual number, even though there's a question of whether the actual measuring of the number affects outcome. And the patients that were discussed last week in the uh, best trip trial, where they had IC, where they were testing whether or not measuring ICP versus uh, doing CAT scans was uh, beneficial and they found no difference. And this was done in Ecuador and Bolivia. Um, they found that when patients actually had ICP measurements, then they re reduced the number of CAT scans. And so the therapeutic intensity was reduced. So having that number is very, very helpful. But there are crit criticisms and questions in decompressive craniectomy. Are we accomplishing anything? with decompressive craniectomy? Are we reducing mortality at the expense of increasing incidence of severe disability in a vegetative state? And in the ideal world, as I mentioned, we really want to have everybody who has suffered from a TBI to go back to their previous level of function. But the problem is, is we really haven't found a magic bullet in order to have that happen. There have been numerous drug trials and hypothermia and other interventions, but nobody has found that they've been very helpful. Um, so what are the reasons for that? And I, we might explore a little bit later some of the reasons why we've had these negative trials and decompressive craniectomy has now been subject to uh, some randomized controlled trials. It is in the current armamentarium of how we treat severe traumatic brain injury. We have ICP monitoring and oxygen monitoring and hyperosmolar therapy, giving mannitol or hypertonic saline, barbiturates or hypothermia, and then decompressive craniectomy is certainly there. I think there's a lot of practitioners that would prefer to take off skull than to have patients undergo uh, barbiturate coma because that's a very intensive therapy. It requires one-to-one -one nursing and it, it requires meticulous management and a decompressive craniectomy might simplify the management significantly. So the first decompressive craniectomy randomized trial was in Australia by Taylor et al. And this was published in 2001, and it was a small group of 27 children. And basically, um, they did bitemporal craniectomies. They didn't open the dura, as you uh, have, might notice in this, in this uh, picture here. The dura is open, and the brain is exposed. If we open the dura, that actually helps reduce ICP more. But they didn't do it. And they found that they actually had pretty good outcomes, uh, 54 uh, percent uh, of good outcomes in these kids versus 14. Again, it's a very small number. And that there was significant ICP reduction, even despite the fact that they didn't open the dura. There was a Cochrane review in 2006 that said due to the lack of randomized controlled trials, they really couldn't recommend decompressive craniectomy. But they did uh, note that Taylor uh, lends conclusions that this would be beneficial in pediatric patients. So before the randomized control trials came out, there were important questions. At what stage do we perform decompressive craniectomy? Do we perform it at the initial operation for mass lesions when swelling is encountered or anticipated, or as a third tier therapy when all other therapies fail, or as a second tier therapy when initial measures were not effective? And would you rather use hypothermia or barbiturates first rather than taking off the skull, which we just spoke about?
everyone. Ryan Rad here from NeurosurgeryTraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.